All right. Good evening, everyone. Final talk of the day before the Q&A session. I hope this is not a sleepy session for you all. So let's do a hands-on guide to object identification. And this is definitely going to be an add-on to Oren Rubin's session, if you all have attended, the statistical element locators. What he talked about was more from his tool perspective as well as something from the basics of locators. However, this is going in depth of object locators, how you have to adopt best practices to identify those locators. And before that, we also see what are those locators like CSS, XPath, and so on. And how does Selenium use it to identify the elements? So consider this as a 101 tutorial on object identification, one of the most basic aspects of automation. Who am I? Okay, a test automation consultant with like close to 10 years of experience working with Selenium based frameworks and other tools as well. I speak at different forums and a trainer, mentor to different MNCs and startups. Just in short, you can visit my profile. What's the agenda for the next 35, 40 minutes? Uh, we cover the basics of object identification. What are CSS selectors or locators as people call them? What are XPath locators? Let's go into a bit of advanced locators, how we can play around with that. A ready cheat sheet for you all. I know like if someone is using Unix, you have those cheat sheets ready printed on your desktops always. Automators can have this cheat sheet now on. And some best practices which uh, I will be sharing based on the experiences as well as case studies on whatever we have experienced so far or the problem areas of automation. And yes, you can tweet on the following hashtags on and make the Selenium conference more popular on Twitter. So let's get into the basics of object identification. Uh, we'll make this interactive. I'm not going to be the only person speaking out here. What exactly do you do when you start automation? Apart from the tooling aspects, you understand the HTML technologies, you understand the web technologies, correct? Or directly do you just go and, okay, selenium dot find element and blah, blah, blah. Do you do that? No. What is the first thing that you do when you open the browser or your application under test? What do you do? Of course, that is what everyone does. Yeah, but you still, you first go, before even object identification, you try to analyze the page source, even before object identification. You try to understand the related underlying HTML technologies that is being used. This often is neglected by automation developers in the beginning, but they eventually learn this by the school of hard knocks. Why? Is because if they don't understand what HTML technology the application is built, they start writing some selectors and use them. Going ahead, these selectors turn out to be fragile and they again go and analyze, oh, this was an Ajax element, I did not analyze this properly. So if you would have analyzed your HTML application correctly, what technology is being used, what kind of JS libraries are used, you will be in a better position to identify your locators. So the first thing, so uh, consider this way, manual testers, automation testers, functional analysts, they understand the business requirements, functional requirements. Automation testers, apart from the functional requirements, they also understand the technical requirements. That is your HTML pieces of code. So that is what I said in the second point, carefully understand your page source, Try to identify what kind of JS libraries are used. There are several JS libraries being developed these days. Several of them are still in development mode, so even they are fragile. So it's better that we carefully analyze such things. Your best friend F12 E on the keyboard, is there F12 or F15? Wake up. F12, sure. There's no F15 key, right? Yeah. F12 key, uh, the automation guy's best friend, Always on any browser it works now. So F12 i, F12 Firefox, F12 Chrome. You will get the developer toolbar and with that you can analyze your element. In fact, with the developer toolbar, 
you need, need not even try that element in selenium you can do it on the console we'll see one example wherein you practically identify the element on the html source and identify that element on con on the console and see whether that is the element that uh, the locator which you have written for that so test your element even before you do it with selenium using the developer toolbar that ensures that at least your selectors are correct locators come first logic comes secondary that's the tagline which i go by if your locators are not strong no matter how strong your logic be your tests are going to be flaky this is what you have to avoid as automation developers because your locators or your tests are built upon the foundations of your locators and then comes the logic so what are the different types of object identification mechanisms so of course from a selenium perspective everyone knows right that it can identify by id name class css all the textbook definitions i'm not going to iterate that the two major things which we'll be discussing in this talk or the session CSS and XPath. That is the one which is primarily used because it helps to identify elements in multiple ways. So let's say if it's only ID, it's only the ID of an element. Yeah. You cannot. It, it's the uh, ask the developer. <laughs> so, however, I mean. Jokes apart, but yeah, uh, CSS is most preferred. A, it is the fastest way to identify elements. B, uh, there are various combinations that you can do with CSS selectors, and hence that is the most preferred one. I cannot say it is reliable, but yeah, it is the most preferred one. From a reliability perspective, it's the application under test that will be causing, uh, that will be answering that question. But however, for any application, CSS is more preferable. Okay, CSS selectors, uh, they go by these basic patterns or the basic ways to identify absolute selectors. So beginners or those who don't know what are absolute selectors, just consider this analogy, world, continent, country, state, street, city, or uh, city, street, sorry. Okay, so if you want to relate this to CSS selectors or rather your html page source world relate to html continent can be your body and then comes all your div span input elements or any other element select boxes and so on so that is how absolute selectors are written relative selectors directly go to that street number okay it's the white house in washington everyone knows the address no need to tell the geographic location so those are what like relative selectors are class or id based selectors finding selectors using any other attribute so when html developers they develop the code it's not only the class or the id that they write okay there can be several other attributes that they give to that particular web element and in this case you also can identify using other elements like name or data elements or data tags and any other attribute that the element carries in its html source partial matching is one way although not a very reliable approach but yeah i mean from the textbook way it is allowed to identify elements with the partial matching approach xpath locators similarly so what is exactly the difference we'll come to that but xpath also they go by a similar definition absolute xpath start from the html body div tags or any other uh, hierarchy but it has to be the full hierarchy and relative again take the example of uh, white house index based xpath is another way to identify so wherein you specify in square brackets 
some index of how that element is appearing in the hierarchy and you can do that as one. Similarly, with other attributes you can uh, find the x bar and partial matching is also another way. We will be seeing the difference between both of them. Okay, coming to partial matches and before that how does CSS and XPath differ? CSS, what is the full form? Awesome, you all are experts in HTML. So, CSS, what are cascading style sheets? That, that was the next question. Okay, so any HTML code that is written, they obviously it's not just uh, plain HTML, right? You have styles along with that, you have some color elements with that, some way to identify that element for the HTML guys as well. This way of writing or specifying attributes to the elements using CSS is also available by browsers to identify that element and hence if it is available to browsers it is also available to Selenium that is how Selenium is built upon. So, CSS selectors they directly go by the CSS properties of the web elements. XPath they go by the DOM, the DOM content of the HTML page. So, since it is DOM, the one fundamental difference between HTML and uh, the XPath and CSS will be the way in which you write the notation of CSS and XPath. So, XPath will always begin by double slash if it is not the root node. If it is the root node that is HTML, it will always start with a single slash. So, if you are writing it manually without the use of Firebug or any other developer toolbar, please be careful that double slash implies that anywhere in the root. Root by root I mean HTML root. CSS, there is no such binding. You can directly write the tag name and the associated property with it. Let us see some complex selectors. So, this is a straightforward comparison between CSS and XPath. Let us say you want to do a partial match wherein you want to find an element which has an attribute that starts with. This is helpful in case of dynamic elements. Let us say the ID is something like user 123456. That 123456 is a numerical uh, symbol and it is going to be fragile for your test. Tomorrow that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 tend to become 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, but that user text will remain the same. So, in this case you can use starting with for CSS the notation is going to be caret equal to. So, how does it look like when we write an actual selector? I will show it separately on uh, the browser also, but yeah, let me show it over here in terms of the how the CSS notations are written since we will make this more of a tutorial based session. So, how does locators look like? It is like tag name for CSS, square brackets, the attribute name, some symbol, I am just putting a question mark over here and the attribute value. So, if you directly want to find by the direct attribute name and value, you can do something like this. So, let us say the HTML element was input with ID equals to username. This is how a CSS selector will look like, but if you wanted to do a partial match wherein let us say the HTML was something of this sort input ID starts with let us say the actual ID for that element is something like this ok. In this case this one will fail whereas this one of course, please do not forget the syntax square bracket should end wherever applicable. This one will pass. 
similarly if you want to do something like ending with the caret equals to will be replaced by dollar equal to and if you want to do a partial contains match wherein let's say the username is preceded by some numbers as well in this case you can do something like input id star equals to this will also work okay so far clear everyone on the selectors the similar notations are there for xpath there is one comparison slide which shows the similar examples for xpath as well few more complex scenarios gradually you all are able to find the basic selectors now with uh, just the attributes the values and so on but there are selectors wherein you have to find them on the basis of relationship or rather the hierarchy of the elements so let's say there is a div tag inside that there are several uh, spans or ul and li inside that you want to find a specific li how do you go by that hierarchy so in xpath and css there are ways in which you can find the ancestor that is the parent parent and parent and descendants so your grandchildren preceding and following your siblings and similarly in css also you have all these options in css there is an interesting option wherein you can also identify elements based on the ui state when i say ui state can someone tell me without okay you'll have it already on the screen so ui state means whether that element is enabled disabled whether it is like a checkbox if it is checked and so on there is an additional way of uh, additional class in css which is called as the not class which often helps to discard some unwanted elements why it helps wherein if you use not so let's say there are several input boxes and you don't want to find the hidden ones you can specify the property over here where not style equals to hidden you can do that in this case okay yeah yeah yes yeah i'll show that in the console how can i do that yeah a simple cheat sheet uh don't worry if the font is too small on the screen it's available on the blog uh but yeah let's take a quick uh, recap of how elements are available or what are the standard ways in which you can identify elements let's say the first one finding by id so the second column that you see is just an html tag with input id equals to user CSS has a shorter notation of writing it wherein id can be replaced as hash and for xpath if you can see there uh there is one symbol over here the at the rate symbol so at the rate in xpath implies that the word preceding after it or after it is the attribute name and after equals to is the attribute value similarly for class in css it can be replaced by a dot notation and xpath it still follows the same way any other attributes so input star uh, input square brackets name equals to some value xpath it still follows the same one here comes the interesting ones a direct child wherein let's say a ul element has several li's so ul greater than li implies that it is the direct child the immediate child and for xpath it is going to be double slash ul slash li of course it still can have any attributes that you want to add with it but yeah this is just a shorter way of writing it right now any grandchild or any child not the immediate child so ul again has several li 
dual space Li. That means that any Li within that dual. And here it will be dual, sorry, double slash dual, double slash Li. So this also implies that let's say the Li again had a dual and inside that there was another Li, it can also pick that Li. Alright, need not be the immediate children, it can be grandchildren in this case. Nth child, a very fragile way of identifying. I have put this because to make you understand that this is a fragile way. It need not be the preferred way to identify elements, it can be your last resort if you are not getting any other option. So let's say you want to go by the index wherein you want the fourth element from the hierarchy, you can have nth of type round brackets and O. And for x path, the index notation will be square brackets and the index of that uh, element. Direct parent, so if for example you want, you have an element, you want to find its parent and then perform some operation on that. So let's say the best example can be the over base submenus, at that time you want to do some operation on the parent. So you can do something like the active one, the active uh, li element and if you can carefully see this is colon parent. This means it gives you the immediate parent in this case. And for x path, there is no special word or notation to write but yeah, you can have slash dot dot. So if you, uh, if you are doing DOS or command prompt, you all know that double dot means the previous directory. So yeah, you can relate to that. So double dot in x path means the previous uh, link or the previous uh, immediate parent. The next sibling, it can be covered by the plus symbol. So there are two li elements one after the other. You have some property to identify the first li element but there is nothing to identify the second one. However, you are interested into the second one. Identify the first one, then do a plus li or the plus next element only by the tag name. You can still identify that by this way. Here, it tends to be a bit complex as well as fragile. Can anyone point out why? In xpath, the same thing in xpath is fragile but in this it is valid. So your example wherein x path is not reliable is clear by this example. Why? Let me explain. The first part, let's break this x path. Double slash li class equals to active. That is the element from where you are going to find the sibling. Here x path first finds the sibling. Point 1. Goes to the parent. Point 2 or above it and then finds by the index. It's a very fragile way of identifying. Yeah. You can do that. There is This is also a way and following sibling is another way. I just wanted to show the significance between how x path can be unreliable at certain time. Now, let's say by text if you want to find link with sign in text. So, a, so a is the standard notation for a link, colon contains sign in and double slash a contains brackets text comma the text that you want to identify it with. So in all these cases you can find elements either by xpath or CSS notation. However, if you see carefully xpaths tend to be a bit longer to write, it is more syntactical this is more symbolic in writing, okay? Okay, so, so far we discussed the basics of all your selectors, the way in which we can identify those elements, play around with the different selectors and find uh, advanced way of uh, element identification. But how can you still make your script more robust? So, sorry. avoid fragile selectors, ones that have numbers, text 
or even if it appears to be variable to you discard it or find a way in which you can write composite selectors so don't just go by one property or one attribute go by at least one or two two to three properties and in this case your element will be much robust as compared to the previous example again when coming to hierarchies or let's say you're going too much switching between parent child and siblings and so on don't rely too much on more than 3 to 4 levels 3 to 4 is also on the higher side ideally 2 to 3 levels should be sufficient to identify any element avoid using more than two attributes for composite selectors so two or three is still a good number more than that again tends to be a bit fragile why is because you never know which attribute is going to change and which is more prone to have dynamic value so again more than two attributes is not a very recommended one okay so we discussed this in the first slide F12, your best friend of automation, guys. Ensure that all your selectors in all your browsers are working in the console. So yeah, in iframe it might not help you, but yeah, you can still identify those elements. The second uh, most important thing, apart from storing your locators, is uh, of course identifying your locators is how you store your locators. Always. from an automation script perspective store it outside your code as much as possible or totally so it can be excel it can be xml text files anywhere but not in your code uh when you come into frameworks yes you will have a robust way of storing your elements but yeah even if you are writing simple script you can go by property files at the least or xml files i'll be showing some examples wherein you can generate simple xml structures to store your elements and at times yes so even in page object model you often store those element locators in those class files that is still a not a very good approach you i mean uh, the whole point which i'm focusing out here is that you should not touch your code if your tests are breaking fix it by selectors outside your code of course if there is a logical change you will have to change your code but at the initial level from a locator perspective you shouldn't be touching your code it also again depends on how large your tests are okay and how many tests you are developing and how complex is your application excel sheets are recommended because uh, many uh, frameworks are still relying upon excel sheets however if you want to move away from excel sheets xml is the best approach and at certain times don't do gui automation at all how question mark thinking on it okay so there are several scenarios in web testing where you can avoid gui automation so it is not really important for you to check that functionality from a gui perspective but you only want to ensure that that functionality is stable go by the web services approach at several instances web applications are developed by the web service mechanisms so just populate your request response xml ensure that those are the correct uh, validations are working on that and then check the response out of it and if you want to only do database level verifications or uh, similar stuff avoid gui automation in certain cases yeah oh you are yawning so you can come there <laughs> no problem uh we'll see some practical examples on how we can identify elements okay so this 
is our demo website. It is also available on the blog site. Uh, we're hosting that. So let's say you want to identify element from here. So let let me show you how the console works. So what's your automation, guys? Best friend F12. This thing opens up over here. So if you see carefully, the first tab, the default one is the element. What does it show? The HTML source content and uh, the related source code for that HTML page. Now you want to identify or inspect this element. You always have this ready-made inspector over here. It points to the corresponding element that you highlighted. Now based on the analysis that you did, you feel that input type equals to email seems to be a more logical way to identify this element. However, I would say type equals to email is again on the lower side of fragility. Why? In this page, there can be several fields having type equals to email. There can be a, a search bar on top wherein you are asked to submit the email. There can be some fields other for entering your email ID. So then go for ID. Example input email. So I'll write my CSS selector something like this. Input example input email one. I copy this. How do I ensure that this is the correct selector before even I run it on my Selenium test? I go to console. There is a very simple way of writing this document dot query selector you get an autocomplete over here it's a mini IDE for y'all and paste the selector over here enter it you see that this is the selector that you had entered and if you just hover your mouse over it the element gets highlighted your query yeah so the element gets highlighted this ensures that this is the element that you were looking for. How do you write this? Document dot query selector. Now this is as good as writing browser dot find element. Okay. Browser dot find element is equivalent to document dot query selector. So is there an equivalent of doc browser dot find elements? Yes, there is something called as document dot query selector all. Let us see the difference between these two. So you all know that dot query selector returns you the first element that is found and query selector all will return you a list of elements. So if you see carefully the difference between these two. This is just a single element whereas here it is coming into an array although the size is one. So let us see wherein we do something like this. Okay, I got all the input elements on the web page. Yeah. So let us see another way of identifying elements or on some other website. Yes, dollar X is also allowed. So basically, dollar X is a shorter notation. Okay, uh, you might not get to uh, work with that in IE at certain times. Okay, and that is why document dot query selector is preferred because that is how even developers use it for their debugging purposes. Okay, no, only CSS. Document dot query selector is CSS and dollar X is uh, uh, X bar. Oh, sorry, dollar dollar is X bar. So let us identify some other elements. Okay. Can you identify this element uniquely? Okay, this is a simple one. Let us. Okay.
let us go to some complex identification tabular ones those are something which is very complex for you correct in this case uh, how are you going to identify each and every row of this particular table so i just want the rows or say a specific column from this row do a right click inspect so you all need to understand the hierarchy of tables in html so that is how you will come to know how the tables are structured in this case table it has some class google visualization table then t body t head is for the header t body will contain all the rows within that t r will contain each row td will contain each column correct in this case do you see a unique way of identifying the columns all the columns have the same sorry class name so how will you identify it in this case there are no other ways except you iterate through the t heads do a textual comparison of the text that you find in in the header columns so let's say you want to find the product name iterate through t head identify what is the index of that particular column then iterate through td all the tds within that tr or within all the trs and pick the td with index that you found from the header rather than going by locators which have index it is better that you do a textual comparison why i'll show you with an example or rather i'll tell you with an example let's say you'll have hard coded the selector wherein the product name is at index 2 0 1 sorry 0 and 1 okay what if tomorrow i change the table structure and move this product name into the column number 3 so your selector is fragile because it is not going to identify the product name although it won't fail it will give you a wrong data correct so in this case go by the textual comparison within your code without any indexes on your locators okay getting it so far yeah yes that is what i explained with css within your code you have to do rather than uh, writing any complex selectors so write simple selectors and loop it in your code so now i want an example or i want to find all the image source links these are the this is just some e-commerce portal i want to find image links for each of this so how am i going to write a selector such that using one selector i get all these images so try to identify a unique thing which is common between all three or all the elements that are desired so in this case image that is the only thing the only tag which these images have so i would not recommend that you only go by the image tag because in a complex e-commerce website image tags are not going to be only for the product images there can be several other images lying around so in this case if you see logically there is a div class equals to product image this seems to be a logical selector wherein the parent has a logical name to it and so we can write it as div dot product image angular bracket image so it will give me the child of a div which is called product image so let us see whether this applies to all the other product images 
yeah the structure is the same you can confirm it with the third one as well so yes div class product image and image src let us confirm this so yeah if you just press the up arrow key over here it will show the history and you can fetch back from it div dot product image hyphen image you can see that you got three images one two and three so in this case you got all the three product images and from this you can now extract the attribute value which is the source that is required for you and use it in your test wherever applicable so these are some basic examples uh, that were there for this particular presentation yeah but there are still complex ways in which sorry yeah so apart from this there are still various mechanisms with which you can write your test in a more stable manner and less flaky test so the whole point to remember avoid fragile selectors don't rely on too much of hierarchies avoid using two or more composite selectors or composite attributes check your selectors in the browsers even before you write your test and store your elements outside your classes so that your code is more maintainable so and wherever applicable don't do gui test at all so that's it for the session all the slides are available on my blog post and i'll be happy to answer any queries questions if you have any sort of related to not only object identification selenium based automation frameworks and so on that's my business card you can just drop me a mail if you need any help i'll be happy to answer that thank you for attending any questions with css and uh, uh, there is this answer ancestors with which you can do that no in css directly there is no css web properties yeah so you can come along i'll be going to meet you Locator search can be done. Okay, so uh, when uh, you say that uh, how Selenium is internally working, correct? So, so it's good or bad, <laughs> right? So why is it worrying you? No, I mean just I'm curious to know that. Okay, so well, uh, see uh, from from the XPath perspective, it captures the whole uh, page source. It captures it as a document object. If you are aware, uh, in Java, uh, Java notation, there is the document factory and the document object. In that, that entire DOM is loaded, and within that, it traverses the whole XPath from the double slash root and so on. Okay, when it comes to CSS selectors, it does not have to traverse the DOM, and it matches those properties in the form of, say, at a higher level, I am explaining that it is like a key value pair for it. Okay, so whichever element in CSS is having those properties, matching those properties, it will go and fetch those elements. So at a higher level, this is what I explain. But yeah, if you want to work the internal mechanisms, you will have to understand the Selenium browser-specific code. So for each browser, the mechanism is a bit different. I mean, for Firefox, Chrome, it is sim uh, similar. I, it is a totally different approach. Yes, it is faster. It uh, secondly, it also reduces the syntax of your locators. Uh, not only fast, it allows you various ways to identify the locators, and that is why it is more reliable. Stability is the concern. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Uh, I mean
mean depending on the application right so depending if that uh, application you know that the id is never going to change you can go for only id rather than css detector that is also allowed however if you feel that the tomorrow that id might change or some other attribute is tending to be fragile then go for a composite one with css or xpath however css is my personal recommendation see i mean from a fragility perspective you cannot trust the developers <laughs> yeah correct yeah that is yeah but always all elements don't have name problem so that is why you have to go for composite elements yeah okay thanks a lot yeah